Nintendo just uploaded their investor presentation for the second half of the financial year. This is usually followed by an investor Q&A which takes a while to be translated, so for now I'm going to focus just on highlights from the presentation itself. We're going to look at the sales data, spend a bit of time exploring the advertising spend and the implications of that and basically just explore the numbers a little bit. So settle in and let's do a Nintendo forecast deep dive on Nintendo's latest quarterly results. So first up we can see that sales are downward but just remember that when Nintendo talks about the trend we're comparing numbers with April to September of 2023, a period which had the Mario movie and Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Not many halves of the year would have matched 2023 with a snap 20 million seller dropping and the buzz of a major movie. So let's cut 2024 some slack for being down on those numbers. A better comparison would be the 2020 and 2021 numbers and here we see that the 2025 net sales figures are down but not as hugely. A 16% drop compared to the same half of the year three years ago which was nominally the height of the Switch's power and a period in which we had an absolute ton of games, albeit smaller ones, such as New Pokemon Snap, Game Builder Garage, Mario Golf Super Rush and Zelda Skyward Sword. Consolidated sales show that the exchange rate continues to benefit Nintendo. Last year the total was 157.8 billion yen earned as a result purely of exchange rates, so the year to date is on course to be less than that figure. The figure for quarter one was 20.8 billion yen, so it looks like the turbulence in the exchange rate during August had a bit of an impact on Nintendo, although of course in quarters where there's less trade, there's less of an exchange rate benefit or penalty to be had at all. In terms of sales, the Switch still has a good international spread, but if we compare to three years ago, Europe and the rest of the world are backsliding comparatively, while the Americas and notably Japan are continuing to grow as a proportion of sales. Japan is to be expected and I think Nintendo has always been strong there but I think it's curious that America continues to hold up and I wonder how they might account for this differential. I guess their theme park areas and stores probably account for part of this. Of course Nintendo recently restructured their operations in Europe and while this appeared to be in response to a retirement it is possible that they will want to give Europe more of a push going forward. Mobile IP related income is the biggest drop which again is the Super Mario Brothers movie effect but these numbers were 25.5 billion in 2021 and the income from these stores is up. Remember this is pre-Alamo since this only covers up to September and that launched in the third fiscal quarter of the year. Although it's not entirely clear whether these numbers incorporate the benefits of the launch of the Nintendo Museum. The gross figures follow the overall trend but there are a few points of note here. Firstly, their gross profit margin increased and they explain it as this is due to factors such as a proportional increase in digital sales relative to overall sales and a decrease in the proportion of hardware unit sales of Nintendo Switch OLED model which has a lower profit margin than other models in the Nintendo Switch family. Now I'll come back to the digital comment in a minute but we always knew that OLED's margins were lower but it's interesting that after all this time it's still statistically significant enough to have a big impact. My assumption was always that they would phase out the original switch and keep the OLED but I do wonder whether this would incentivize them either to prioritize the light or to do their own console, a 2DS XL kind of deal for the later stages of the switch's existence. I've mused this before and I still think it's about an even likelihood that we will see a fourth iteration of the classic Switch. Other things of note here, the proportion of first party software sales is down quite a bit but that's the Tears of the Kingdom effect again. Hardware sales are up as a percentage but since it's proportionate that's a little misleading. Then we have selling general and administrative expenses. Well these are up but I guess the one everyone beelines for is research and development which is up 15.5%. Now for reference it was 42.1 billion yen in 2020 and 44.1 billion yen in 2021 so R&D spend is up significantly. 
Of course, I rather doubt they're still funding the new console development this late on, but they are building new premises and are doubtless exploring all kinds of technologies, not just within the development group at EPD, but animation technologies through their relatively new Nintendo Picture subsidiary. And we know from developer interviews, which I covered recently, that Nintendo systems have spent a lot of time rejigging their accounts system architecture. They acknowledge the impact of foreign exchange losses in the slide on ordinary profit and net profit, although frankly I think they've probably benefited more from the exchange rate than they've lost. To be honest, with the recent turbulence in the Japanese election, the yen itself seems unlikely to make any major moves for a while, which will be good for Nintendo, although of course the strength of the dollar and the euro as well as other key currencies for them like the Australian Canadian dollars, the British pound sterling, and the South Korean one would also be of interest, although the information is not captured in this slide. So on this slide here, we see their forecasts, and their forecasts have been modified slightly down, which suggests that the last few months did not go quite as they had hoped. To be honest, given their fairly meagre game lineup over this time, a game lineup they must have known would be in train since March when these forecasts were determined, I'm not quite sure what they expected and it does make me wonder whether there was another project that was internally delayed, especially given how weak the first quarter of the year was. I can't see what that would have been though as Super Mario Party Jamboree was always likely to go in the now traditional Mario October slot and I don't think Xenoblade Chronicles X Definitive Edition would have moved such massive sales even if it were to have been scheduled for earlier and there's no evidence that it was. Of course, forecasts aren't a perfect art, trust me, I can relate. So perhaps they just decided, as they have in the past, to go in optimistic and then revise down if need be. It's still, to be fair, quite a subtle revision. Their comments on all this don't add extra light particularly. The biggest question is really how well the third quarter, i.e. October to December, does, and this is really the trickiest to predict. It is always by far the biggest sales window, and so it has a bigger proportionate effect on the sales for the year in total. I can see that recent changes for Nintendo Switch Online would have consolidated memberships, which is important for Nintendo keeping their base steady, while Super Mario Party Jamboree feels like it ought to be a very successful title based off the success of the prior two Mario Party games. Now, there are lots of things they could continue to do to drive sales, including deals or new announcements, and I reckon Based on past trends, which I've deep dived in a prior video, there is a 90% chance of at least one new yet to be announced game releasing in the January to March quarter and a 70% chance of two or more new titles in this long window between Donkey Kong Country Returns HD in early January and Xenoblade Chronicles X Definitive Edition in late March. But generally, and with occasional exceptions, the biggest titles in the January to March quarter tend to go towards the end, so it seems improbable that we'll see anything significantly bigger in scale than Xenoblade, although of course they could do something quite profitable that is notionally a smaller game. For example, if they dropped a Mario collection for Mario Day, say a limited edition collection of the new Super Mario Brothers games, that would doubtless spike huge sales in the last month of the financial year, even though it would be, judging from the Super Mario 3D All-Stars collection, probably fairly low effort. Generally, they don't like to cannibalise the sales of their biggest titles, and I'm sure they'll rather people go for Super Mario Bros. Wonder over a Super Mario Bros. collection, but it is Mario's 40th anniversary after all, and the Wii game in particular must be low-hanging fruit to port over, so I'd give some kind of presence for any of the older three new Super Mario Bros. titles which aren't yet on Switch, a 50% chance of showing up by the end of the 2025 to 2026 fiscal year. Of course, if it did arrive at the end of this fiscal year, it would help Nintendo to meet their targets. Still, Nintendo are basically leveraging their evergreens at this point, since none of the other titles this year feel like they're going to do numbers outside the 1, 2, 3 million range that most smaller scale first party titles live in. And speaking of which, Let's pivot over to the sales status of the Switch and its games. So the game sales are interesting. With only a few weeks under its belt, Echoes of Wisdom totted 2.58 million units. In 2019, they confirmed that sell-through of Link's Awakening in the same period was 
over 2 million units. So Echoes of Wisdom is doing well, especially when you consider that Link's Awakening launched with hardware, being the game chosen to launch with the Switch Lite. Although to be fair, the install base of the console was vastly smaller in 2019. I think this must be a pleasing number to them, as with the holiday season coming up, it will only grow. And I also think the decision to send on Zelda will be of benefit to diversifying their merchandise line. So it's likely that by raising the profile of Zelda herself, Echoes of Wisdom will have a positive effect beyond its raw sales numbers going forward. More disappointing on the surface are the numbers for Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Origami King sold 2.82 million in the same period, and The Thousand Year Door had already sold 1.76 million by the end of the first quarter of this financial year, suggesting that it put on about 180,000 in sales in the summer quarter. Now, we should heavily caveat these numbers. First of all, Origami King sold mid-pandemic. The only games Nintendo had launched in that year prior were Good Job, Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, and Clubhouse Games. So in many respects, this was their first core audience style title and the only new one since the other release of the first half of the 2020 to 2021 fiscal year was the Super Mario 3D All-Stars Collection. In 2024, there's just a lot more competition for game sales and while Luigi's Mansion 2 HD didn't do gangbuster numbers, it's still another Mario Universe title and of course the Thousand Year Door followed the release of Super Mario RPG just the previous November. It's difficult to say too much because we don't have a large number of examples on the Switch of a franchise getting two original entries. The Luigi's Mansion 2 HD sales are a significant drop on Luigi's Mansion 3, but if they want to push one of those, it's surely got to be the vastly superior Luigi's Mansion 3 anyway, so Luigi's Mansion 2 HD feels like more of a quick cash grab. Emily though, second games on a console sync in sales, the classic example of course always being Super Mario Galaxy 2, which despite being a hugely applauded game, was very much down on its predecessor. I think the fact that Echoes of Wisdom was such a different version of Zelda, and it was explicitly an heir stylistically at least to the hyper-popular wild games, probably makes Echoes the exception rather than the rule here. Forgotten Land would be another exception where the second mainline Kirby was clearly different and blasted itself to success over and above the more anemic sales of Kirby Star Allies. Now, of course, the Thousand Year Door was different from Origami King in many ways, but I'm not sure how obvious those differences were to casual fans. 3D Kirby versus 2D Kirby is a very stark, marketable difference. Zelda in the lead with the copy abilities is a very clear way to say this is new and fresh and not just another 2D Zelda. But the Thousand Year Door is literally an old game. I doubt they ever expect it to outperform its predecessor, although I guess the final judgment on it will come after we have sales numbers for Mario and Luigi Brothership and we can look at the trends across the recent Mario RPG lines. It's also positive that they comment that sales grew steadily for the Thousand Year Door, Luigi's Mansion 2 HD and Echoes of Wisdom, although to be honest, since Echoes of Wisdom was released so late, I'm not sure that it had time to grow steadily or otherwise. Still, 180,000 and a quarter for Paper Mario isn't dreadful if it can be sustained through word of mouth over the long term. Also of note in these figures is the increased sales for all Switch models, but notably the Switch Lite. This is accounted for in Nintendo's accompanying commentary for this slide. Essentially, they say that the release of the special Hyrule Edition model of Switch Lite helped boost sales. It's interesting that this gives us an idea of the effect of this endeavour with the rise from 0.33 million to 0.64 million, suggesting that if they could find games with a similar reach as Zelda that would entice people by multiple systems, then they could add another maybe quarter million to their sales over and above the normal changes from having just more games. This would make an Animal Crossing spin-off title around February make a lot of sense if this was part of their strategy. Animal Crossing is another franchise capable of shifting Switch lights, and this, again, would help with their overall strategy, especially when you consider that the Switch Lite is one of their more profitable consoles. Or, of course, a Mario Day-themed Mario Switch Lite would also be perfectly possible. 
Moving on, digital sales continue to be resilient, but actually this slide feels to me to be slightly, very slightly misleading. Whenever Nintendo has a big sales quarter, it tends to attract casual fans, and these people are more likely to buy physical. So in the April to June quarter of 2023, digital sales were 47.3%. But this was, as I keep saying, the quarter of Tears of the Kingdom and the Mario movie, so it's not a surprise that there were more win Nintendo physical sales. This slide doesn't show that figure, and so the headline figure of a rise year on year of 6% in terms of digital sales, while technically true, doesn't to me really capture the whole story. The actual proportion of sales that are digital hasn't changed all that much, and we can expect that percentage to dip again for the coming quarter as people look to buy physical gifts that can go under, for example, a tree. Also, because digital sales include Nintendo Switch Online, it's easy to see the source of a large increase in the digital proportion over the years of the Switch with the first Nintendo Switch Online and then the expansion pack expanding their marketplace. With these initiatives now likely having reached a saturation point or close to it, it's not obvious to me that digital games are becoming particularly more successful and that there is a vast increase in the scope of Nintendo's digital sales right now. Okay, let's tilt over to the sales breakdown by region, where it reports, in fact, a loss for other regions of the big three in the other category of official sales merchandise. An explanation for this isn't given, so I would guess that this has to do with something to do with exchange rates. Obviously, in the past, Nintendo has had big issues with other regions, such as when they pulled out of Russia, but currently there aren't any big changes that I can see. Still, take a look at the difference between Japan and the Americas in terms of mobile and IP-related income this year as opposed to last. While income streams have remained fairly stable in Japan from IP-related content this year as opposed to last, there was a huge bubble last year. Again, the launch of the theme park area probably helped last year, but then you would expect these kinds of attractions to be run with fairly steady audiences, so the profits shouldn't fall off a cliff in this way. So I would guess that it shows the mobile and visual content sales, specifically of course that Super Mario Brothers movie, were much better received in America than Japan, which makes sense of course as it's an American movie and the potential American market is much huger than Japan's. Still, it opens the prospect that Nintendo will be even more exposed to international markets if they continue the route of an IP strategy than they currently are, which probably isn't a problem for them as long as the yen remains significantly weaker than the competition. I didn't mention advertising expenses before, but here they are again with the forecast. Now at this point you might be getting excited. Look at the jump up from Q1-2's projected numbers to the whole fiscal year. That's more than the doubling you would expect from the second half of the year. And the predicted spend on advertising is certainly higher than the 75.4 billion yen from 2018 to 2019 and the 76 billion yen from 2019 to 20 a year, which of course included the launch of the Switch Lite console and a number of major titles such as Animal Crossing New Horizons. But of course, Q3 to 4 includes the holiday season, and so it's expected that Nintendo would generate more advertising expenses in this window anyway. There's definitely the potential in these figures for this to incorporate a big push on the Switch successor and of course last year's half one of the financial year's figures include, as I keep saying, the Mario movie It Is of the Kingdom. So proportionately we're talking about an advertising spend of a similar or even slightly larger scale for Q3 and Q4 put together. Now Q3 has seen quite a few promotional activities already with Alamo and the Animal Crossing Pocket Camp app, so that tracks and Nintendo are clearly pushing their evergreens, which requires more advertising by definition. A title like Tears of the Kingdom is going to scoop the pool of the more dedicated fan base on day one, even if they shadow drop it, but by now, the market for even a gigantic title like Mario Kart 8 Deluxe must surely be quite saturated without focused advertising to push it out. So, do these numbers rule out or rule in an early Switch successor launch? Well, not necessarily either. Nintendo's ad budget for the financial years ending 2016 and 2017 
the latter of which of course included the launch of the Nintendo Switch, were more or less identical. But then again, I'm not sure they were putting any real effort into the Wii U at this point, and so they probably loaded a lot of their budget onto the Switch launch itself. And of course, they launched Switch Lite with a smaller budget, but that was the Lite. The big swell in ad spend came not in 2016 to 2017, when the original Nintendo Switch launched, but in 2017 to 18, the first year on the market, and especially the first holiday season. Actually, advertising spend costs were addressed directly by then President Tatsumi Kimishima in a 2016 briefing. He said, We have been reviewing advertising expenses from the point of view of balancing revenue and expenses and of whether the spending level is appropriate in proportion to our sales. As a result, we have reined in advertising expenses to a certain degree over the last few years and this has helped to balance revenue and expenses. However, the whole point of advertising is to convey information appropriately to consumers, so we cannot simply cut spending. With the progress of technology, advertising media and methods now go beyond television ads to include many different options. Those who come into contact with games for the first time are not that interested to start with, so for those types of people, I agree with you that we need to carefully consider our timing and approach. We intend to come up with detailed plans on what message to convey to what types of consumers with what kind of timing and push this forward with an eye to cost effectiveness as well. I should also point out, of course, that in March 2017, there was a severe shortage of Nintendo Switch consoles, so that might have contributed to the decision to hold off on a major advertising spend until the subsequent financial year. Still, while I think it 90% likely that the ad spend next year will be up on this financial year, it seems that ad spend alone can't be used to deduce the console movement directly. My guess is that they relied on Breath of the Wild to more or less sell itself out in 2017, and if they have a game or concept that can capture even a fraction of this excitement to launch Switch 2 with, given the existing install base of the Switch and the number of people keen for SQL system, I think we will see a similar pattern whereby they concentrate their advertising spend not on the launch itself, but on following up the launch with a strong initial holiday season. Given a range of other facts in the world, I'm cooling on a launch before Golden Week. I always thought April would be a good day for them, historically the Game Boy release date, and the N64 was planned to release in this window too, although it was pushed back to June. And it coincides with the Easter and Golden Week holidays in the West and Japan respectively. I now think there's only a 10% chance as the reveal to release window is very tight. Finally though, let's have a look at the sales units forecast across the world. Obviously sales have dipped globally, but Nintendo will still hope to be on a broad track. And of course, many fans would love to see the Switch lift the crown from the PlayStation 2 and Nintendo DS to become the best selling console of all time. This kind of reinforces the trend that Japan is holding on much better than the rest of the world, which also speaks to why there's a low-key chicken little vibe about some of the coverage of Nintendo in the West, while Nintendo of Japan seem to be just chilling. From their vantage point in Japan, the last year hasn't been all that bad. Still, it seems like the original Switch is actually selling better than last year in the Americas. Perhaps this is because of the decrease in people buying OLEDs without the promotion around Tears of the Kingdom, and the fact that people buying the system are doing so on price considerations now. The Switch Lite also remains resilient. Until now, Switch Lite has definitively been the poor relation in terms of sales, but if they want to pivot the Switch to being a long-selling, cheap-to-buy, and yet helpful for Nintendo, I margin, alternative to their new successor model, then I think Switch Lite could yet have its day in the sun. Okay, that's a wrap for me for now. I will cover any news from the Q&A if there's anything in particular to note when the actual translation comes out from Nintendo. In the meantime, do check out some of my past videos on screen right now for more forecasting goodness. Thank you very much as ever to my Patreon subscribers and otherwise have a great day and I'll see you next time for another Nintendo Forecast.